let's go ahead and get started. Um, and thanks everybody again for joining us on another NG Conf webinar. I'm your host Q, and today I'm joined by one of the most decorated Angular GDEs I've ever met. Actually, I don't even know if Alan remembers this, but at NG Conf two years ago, we sat by each other behind the speakers. Like I was like kind of starstruck. I didn't even say hi to you. Um, <laughs> you pulled up, and I was like, "Oh, I think that's Alan." I think you had just got named um, a Cyprus um, ambassador as well, like right around that same time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, when I when I got back into Angular, Alan was one of the first people I started following on Twitter again. So that's that's something. Uh, today he's going to be joining us. Um, today teaching us about signal based architecture in Angular. But before we get started, um, I do want to post our code of conduct, as this is a ng-conf um, sponsored event. All rules and code of conduct are still the same. That means, in short, be kind, be respectful in the chat. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A portion of Zoom. Um, Alan will get to those as soon as he has time between his segments. Um, I'll be monitoring them and, and picking some of the best ones to give him um, during that downtime. And without further ado, Alan, go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. There you go. And so, yeah, today we are going to talk about signals. And I know the title of the workshop is Signal-Based Architectures for Angular. But the thing is, signals are not that big, right, in terms of uh, features and API. So I thought, hey, why not cover pretty much everything? That's that's even better. Uh, so that if you're completely new to signals, you'll still be able to follow along. And I'll basically, you know, start with the basics, go a little bit deeper. And, and the idea is really to show you uh, how you can think about using signals in your Angular applications, how you can start architecting things in a way that prepares your application for a future of Angular where pretty much everything is going to be based on signals. That's that's the idea. So my name is Alan, or just Al, and I'm a GDE in Angular and Google Maps. Started with Angular a very long time ago, back in 2011, which makes me feel old every time. Uh, but super grateful to be part of the Angular community because uh, well, the framework has really been spoiling us over the years, especially the last couple of years have been very exciting for Angular. Lots of new cool things such as signals have been released and, uh, and yeah, you know, some, some good features to reignite our love for, for Angular. Um, I'm a web consultant and technical trainer. My website is angulartraining.com which is the main home base for everything I do. Um, I know quite a few of you already follow my blog and my weekly newsletter. You can find all of that on angulartraining.com. And quite a few of you have seen me at conferences as well. So I've been speaking at conferences, mostly about Angular all around the world, been to all continents to talk about web development. So that's, that's pretty cool. And um, one last thing before I get into signals, if you're an Angular developer and want to showcase your skills, uh, we are running a certification program run by Google developer experts in Angular, including myself, of course. You can find all of the info at courses.angulartraining.com. And we have three levels of certification from beginner. So if you're just getting started with Angular, and want to showcase your skills, there is a level one certification for that. If you're, you know, have five, six months of experience, maybe one year and want to showcase your intermediate skills, that's level two. And if you're an expert with years of experience, there's a level three certification for that. So feel free to go take a look at those. And if you have any questions, you can always ask me. You can reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter, email, People who know me know that I always answer within a few hours maximum. So I'm, I'm very reactive on all of these things. So signals, why signals? So you know it's kind of the hot topic in Angular right now, and for good reason. Now, you know, we have a tendency as developers to 
always quickly embrace what's new and what's shiny and uh, oh, there's new stuff. Let's let's just use it, right? And and sometimes we don't think too much about it just because it's new and shiny. We tend to use it. Signals are different, and I want to emphasize that because it's not just a new fashion in Angular. It's really the direction that the Angular team is taking for the framework, and so. Using signals right now makes perfect sense. It's not something that's going to disappear in a year or two. It's really the future of, of Angular and the future of how we build apps with the frameworks. That's that's very important. So the basics of signals are three new functions or reactive primitive. And the idea is to help us implement reactivity everywhere have precision updates. I'll get back to that in a few seconds. And signals are super fast and lightweight. The size of the signals library API is just two kilobytes of code. So, and it's part of Angular. So you don't need a third party dependency to use signals, which is always a bonus. So the main thing about signal and the main reason why it's a game changer from my perspective is change detection. So there's, there's really two main topics when we talk about signals. The first one is you can see them kind of as a replacement of RxJS. So if you struggle with RxJS and operators and subjects, you can think of signals as a way to do pretty much everything you did with RxJS, but in a new and easier way. So that's one approach to signals, easier to learn, easier to get into than RxJS. The second really big, big thing about, uh, about signals is the way it's changing change detection in Angular. And so to me, that's the most important one. And that's the one that's going to change things, even if you're already familiar with RxJS, even if you don't mind operators and subjects, this part is what needs your attention, I would say, and that's change detection. So when you use a regular Angular app with, let's say, no optimization at all. You use a default change detection. You don't try to, to do anything fancy. Things are going to work like this. If you have a button or any event happening anywhere in your component hierarchy, so what you see on my screen is a hierarchy of components, a tree of components from the app component at the top to all of these branches and leaves with components. Anything can happen anywhere in that hierarchy. It's going to trigger. So zone.js is our kind of change detection library in Angular right now. And it's saying it's a change detection library is actually too much because all zone.js does is tell Angular something happened. And so when you click on a button or a timer goes off, you know, set timeout, set interval, HTTP request completes, all of these sorts of things. Zone.js just knows that it happens and tells Angular something changed, and that's it. And then Hang Angular has to figure out what happened and what changed. And so it's going to have to check all of the components, all of the views, and go from top to bottom, which is performant and works because we've been using Angular for years that way. And, and we don't complain much about it. It's, it's, it's getting the job done. But the thing is, as you can imagine, it could be a lot better. It could be a lot more optimized and a lot, lot more precise. And, and that's what we mean by precision updates. And that's what signals are enabling. Because when we use a signal in Angular, the idea is that when you use a signal in an HTML template of your component or in a service, any piece of code that's using a signal is being registered as a dependency. And when the signal changes, so if you change the value of a signal, then all of these dependencies automatically receive the update. And Angular knows that it has to re-render those components that are impacted. Now, that's a big, big deal, right? Because before, all we knew was something happened, and then Hang Angular had to check everything. And now with a signal, if you change a value, then only the pieces of code that depend on that value get refreshed. 
and you get that for free. You don't even have to subscribe to the signal. You don't have to use operators. You don't have to use callbacks or any sort of, of these things. Just the fact that you're reading a signal in a component automatically makes it a dependency. And then you get that behavior of, you know, change detection that's super precise and focused on just what has, what needs to be updated. And I mentioned components uh, in terms of change detection, components that have to be updated when the value changes. It's actually even more precise than this because when we use signals, uh, the change detection is at the view level. And if you're not familiar with an Angular view, you can just think of them as a subset of a template. Like when you use an ng4 directive or ngif or any structural directive or any ng template, you're creating a new view. And so that, if, if that view is using a signal, the view itself is the one that depends on the signal. And that's the one that's going to be refreshed if the signal changes. So it's not even the entire component that needs to be refreshed, but just the view that uses it. So it's even way more precise than anything we had before because and angular has never been about re refreshing individual views and now we have this available thanks to to signals which is pretty powerful so that's really the the part where it's it, it's a game changer right not only if you're new to angular but for existing applications for existing massive applications you can really optimize performance quite a bit because well you have that change detection that's as precise, as focused as possible on the small bits that have to change and not the entire component tree or an entire component uh, either. So that's, that's very powerful. So the idea, and, and, and that's why it's very important. I, I wanted to start with this so you understand the, the benefit you're going to get if you start switching to signals and if you start adopting them in your architecture, because the end goal is really this is to be able to to have that perfect change detection that's going to improve and optimize everything. So next thing we're going to do is uh, well, take a look at how to do this and I'll do some live coding to to get you into the into the signals API. I'll go through examples as much as possible. So we, we, we're going to do it through code so you can really see how signals would fit into an existing application. And this application is going to be one of my favorites. That's, that's the one I use for training most of the time. Uh, this is my license plate store. So you've probably seen it before if you've seen any of my talks. Um, it's a basic store where you have products that are being displayed. These products can be added to a cart, removed from a cart, and then you can check out. And the idea, what we want to implement in this workshop is the ability to switch the currency. So right now we have this component up here, which is called currency switcher. It's a drop down, and I can click on other values, but when I click, nothing happens. So what we want to happen is that if I select Euro, all of my prices here are going to change to Euro and an exchange rate is going to be applied to all of these prices. So let's start with that. So there's really three pieces of architecture that we have to touch in that application. The first one is this component, the currency switcher component. We have the license plate component, which is you know, these products, right, that, that display um, the license plate info. And then we're going to have a service in between. And that service is going to be called currency service because it's the one managing currencies. So let's take a look at that code. This is my currency switcher component. So the templates, it's just a drop down with items that we can click on. And there's a button showing the current currency, which right now is art coded to USD. And the component doesn't do anything yet. We have a to do here because we want to rely on our service to make these changes happen. Um, and if you see anything that you want to ask about in my code, feel free to use the Q&A. 
uh, I'll start taking questions and answering them in a couple of minutes. So feel free to start filling the Q&A with questions and we'll go through that very quickly, very soon. Um, so currency switcher component is here. Now I want to, I want this component to know what is the current currency. So this is going to be handled by currency service, which is typical pattern in Angular applications. We want to rely on services to access the business logic, the data, and uh, all of that related stuff. So we go to our currency service, and right now it doesn't do anything. So let's make that currency service a little bit more useful by storing the currency in here. And to do so, because we want to have those benefits of change detection that's greatly improved, we're going to make it a signal. And that signal is going to have a default value of USD. So using the signal function that gets imported from Angular Core, and there we go, we have a signal that's going to store a currency. Now, that would be the default syntax, the, the, you know, the most naive implementation you can think of, but we can make this a little bit smarter. First, I can make it read-only to make sure that no one is going to change that value and assign another, another signal to it. And maybe I don't want to expose that signal to the public. I, I want to only have a specific way to read the values and set the values. So I'm also going to make it private for now. So private read-only signal that stores a value of USD. And these are some you know, best practices or recommendations that I'm throwing here and there. Um, just to make things safer, using features from TypeScript to help us, you know, better architect this uh, this application and and make things a little bit better. Um, another thing that we have here, so USD is a, a currency, and in my app, I actually have a type somewhere, and that type is called currency, and it looks like this. So it's a union type that tells us that a currency is either USD or GBP or Euro. And that way, you know, I use type safety just to, to be safe and make sure that we, we only stick to these three different options. So what I can do in here is give that information to my TypeScript compiler. And I, I'm going to do so by using a generic here. And so I'm going to say that this is a signal of currency. And if I don't do this, then TypeScript would assume that my signal is of string by default, right? If I remove this, you will see that when I go over, it says signal of string as a type. So now we get back to this and we add currency. And now my signal is uh, a, a signal of type currency, which is a lot better a lot more precise. So from the basic syntax of, you know, just uh, creating a signal, now we have a few extra tips and tricks to, to kind of improve and, and make things more scalable, make things more, you know, maintainable for the dev team to understand what you're doing. So a precise type and indicating that this is read-only. So, okay, to do number one is done. We have a way to store the currency as a signal, and then we need to be able to use it. So we want to expose that signal in a read-only manner. So for this, there's two options. I'm going to start with the one that I tend to favor, and that's because I have a, a background as a Java developer, so I like getters from <laughs> the, just from from ex, from you know what a habit i would say out of habits i i tend to use getters like this so i would create a getter that returns a signal of type currency and we would do return this dot currency and an extra little bit of safety here is to return it as read only so we return our signal but we make it read only just to make sure that you know, we cannot mess with it and um, and a component can only read the value and not set a new value to it. So that's option number one, 
to get that value, to get that signal. Option number two would be to create another property. Now I would have to find a different name. I'm going to call it currency signal, not very original, but I'll make this one public. I still want it to be read only. And it would be equal to this dot currency dot as read only. So that option would be the alternative to using a getter. One or the other would be fine. Both are public, and it's up to you to decide whether you want to use a method to access a signal or if you want to make it available like this uh, as a read only property. So now we can access that value. Let's, um, let's read it in our currency switcher component. So we inject our service here. And what I'm going to do is read the currency, or well, access the currency signal really, by doing this dot service dot get currency. So this returns my signal. Let's store the currency. And now that it's in here, of course, we can also define and be precise with the types in here, even if the compiler already knows that, just to be 100% precise. And so you can visualize it. So I'm going to add the type here. And then in our template, we just use it. So here, instead of art coding USD, we are now reading the value of the currency signal. And to read the value of the signal, we call it as a function like this. So does it work or did I break anything? Well, my button still says USD here. So that's a good sign that it's working because this USD value comes from this expression where we're reading the value of our signal. So, so far so good. We can read the value of the signal and display it and it's exposed in our service in a safe read only way. So either like this or like that, I'm going to remove this one and keep the getter for now. So let's go through some questions because I, I see that a few of them popped up in the Q&A. So let's do that. Um, Did you want me to ask them for you or you, or you got it? Um, up, up to you, yeah. If, if, if you want to, to pick your favorite ones, you can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right, well, well, we'll start with the one that came in earlier. Um, Andre has asked us, um, are signals using the normal mark for check or to mark everything dirty down from, from the root down to all the other components or is it using something more clever or more specific to signals? Yes, that's a very good question. So the, the first implementation of signals was doing exactly that, what you mentioned. So it was using mark for check to show that the component is dirty and that Angular has to check it. Uh, but now with the latest version of Angular with 18, we have uh, an experimental approach where there is a new change detection mechanism that's happening and that's not doesn't even need that anymore. So there's a new scheduler within the framework that takes care of that for us. And that allows us to, to do change detection without even marking for check. So it's, it's, it's still a work in progress. It's still, we're still in this transition phase where things are happening, but yeah, you guessed right. The, the initial approach was to use mark for check, but now there's a, uh, a smarter way to do it. And the Angular team has, uh, has started going in that way. Sweet. Um, an another one um, that was asked about signals was, is there a naming convention for signals, like the dollar sign that's used for um, observables? Yeah, so that's that's an easy one. There's no naming convention at this point. It's really up to you to decide if, if you want one or not. Um, yeah, I I'm using WebStorm as an IDE. And you can see that WebStorm is automatically using a different color for signals which is good. I mean, it, 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 it gets a job done. So this teal light blue kind of color 
is what WebStorm is automatically using when we have a signal. And that way, I don't need to have a specific name for it. So you can rely on your IDE to some extent uh, to, to get that job done. And yeah, the Angular team, the community so far, they, they don't think that we, we need to do anything else in terms of naming conventions. All right. Um, last one before you can get going again is um, any difference between using the um, the hashtag or private keyword for marking a class field private? Yes, that's a that's a very good question. So uh, private using it like this is kind of the legacy way of doing it, uh, meaning TypeScript knew how to do this a long time ago, and then just turning this into a, a private field in JavaScript. Whereas when you use the uh, the hashtag like this. This is the JavaScript syntax. So this one uh, came later. I think it was ES 2016 or 17, something like this, maybe even later. Uh, and so it, it's kind of changes the way the compiler is going to do it. But at this point, it's really a matter of preference, completely up to you. Uh, if you want to use private or the hashtag, the hashtag is shorter. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess I'm always biased by my Java background and used to, I've been used to, to use private for so long that I kind of stick with it. <laughs> but yeah, the short answer is you can use one or the other. That's perfectly fine. The compiler is going to know what to do with it no matter what. Okay, so let's get back into our code. So we have a getter, we have a signal. Now we want to expose a way to change the value. So I'm going to do it with some sort of setter. Set currency takes a currency as a parameter and returns nothing. And in here, all we do is update our currency signal using the set method and setting a new currency to it. So that's my setter to change the value. And this value change is going to happen in our currency switcher. So when in our dropdown, we select a new currency, whether it's USD, Euro, GBP, we want to notify our service. And so in here, in that method, we are going to do this dot service dot set currency with our new selection. So the nice thing about this is that, as you can see, there's no more subscriptions anywhere. There's no RxJS, no operators, just a setter and a getter. And we read the value in here. Let's check that it's working. So I go back to my app. I go to the drop down, I select Euro, and now the button says Euro, which means it's working because the value of the button is read from the signal. So when I click on GBP, value becomes GBP and it shows up up here. Another nice thing about using signals is that if I go to the DevTools and use the Angular DevTools, I can go to my currency switcher component and if I scroll down, you see that currency is a read-only signal and it shows the current value of GBP. And I can even go to the service and see that there is a currency signal with a value of GBP. And when I change the value, of course, this gets reflected in our dev tools as well. So signals are also easy to debug because the Angular DevTools are fully up to date and aware of signals. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's showing up as is with the current value um, in the DevTools, which is pretty interesting and powerful. So now we have the first half of our implementation done. We have the service that's exposing a signal with an API on top of it to just restrict it a little bit. This 
I would say is optional. You could just use a signal as is if you wanted to, but that kind of getter and setter could be useful if you want to track other things, if you want to add some logging, if you want to, I don't know, update multiple signals out of that setter. Uh, having a method allows you to have possibly more code in the future. Um, so yeah, currency service is done. Now, what we want to do is really have those prices change because I selected a new currency here, but my prices are still the same as before. So let's do that. I go to my license plate component. And when I look at license plate component, it's receiving inputs. And using those inputs, it's displaying a, a currency, uh, not a currency, just the license plate information and the text for the button. So we need a third piece of info here. And that third piece of info is going to be the currency. So in here, I'm going to add currency. And so always thinking in terms of architecture, always thinking in terms of best practices, this component, the way it is designed now, it only relies on inputs to get its data. It doesn't have any service injected, which means that it's a presentation component or, you know, what we call, what we call dump components at times. And these components are great because they are typically designed for reusability to be as generic as possible. So I want to keep that pattern in place and I want to keep those components as reusable as possible, which means that my currency signal is going to be uh, an input as well. And now the good thing is that since Angular 17.1 or 17.2, inputs can also be signals. And so my, I can use the following syntax here to indicate that we have an input. So see the difference? It's a function, this input function that comes from Angular core instead of a decorator. And this makes currency an input signal. Now, this is very powerful. I can also say that it is required using that option. And I can also say that the data we expect is a currency. And that way we have everything we need for that, uh, for that input. We'll do the, since we are migrating to signals, I can change these other inputs to signal as well. So instead of using the decorator, I'm just going to say that this is a, an input function. And same for license plate up here. It's going to be an input of license plate, license plate. And I can get rid of the decorator. And this one button text by default would be an empty string. And so, yeah, now I can remove the decorator and we have what we can call a signal based component, which means this component is fully ready to embrace signal based change detection. It's relying 100% on signals. Everything in that component is a signal. So all of the inputs are signals, which is perfect. So now we have to pass that data uh, from the parent. The parent in our case is called store view component. This is the one here. So you see that it's not compiling at this point. And that's because my currency was declared as a required input. And because it's required, I need it. So the compiler says, hey, you're missing the currency input here. So, okay, that's, that's true. So let's add it. I'm going to add an input for currency and the value is going to come from our service. So I need to inject my service and get the currency from it. So I do currency equals and using the new wish inject function, I can inject currency service and just get my currency signal out of it. And that gives me my currency. And now I can pass this 
to in my template right here and pass the value of that signal as an input. And now let's double check the template of that license plate component because we want to make sure that it's, it's actually using that currency. So here we change everything to signals. So we need to read the values from the signal for all of these values. And the currency here goes away. Instead, we're going to use the currency pipe and read the value of our currency from the input signal. Now you can see that all of these give me an error that hey, it's possibly undefined, possibly undefined, possibly undefined. And that's because my plate signal was not marked as required. And I make it required because it doesn't make sense to display that component is if we don't have that data, it, it would be absolutely useless to use it. So let's make that input required, which means now it's a signal of license plate. It cannot be empty, it can be undefined, and the compiler is going to enforce that. And now I don't need any question mark or anything here. I can just read the values. So that's a lot better. And let's test that it's working, hopefully. So USD, prices are in USD. I go here, click Euro, and we see the Euro symbol being displayed. So that's good. Select GBP, and we see the GBP symbol being displayed. So, so far, so good. I know that my service is doing its work, work job. My signals are being propagated properly, and we migrated another component to completely signal-based in the process using those signal input functions. So we are almost done with implementing that feature. The last step is going to be, well, the most interesting one, because it's going to involve making a request to a server. It's going to involve RxJS. So we'll get into that. But before, let's answer some questions. Because I see there's quite a few open in the Q&A. So yeah, Q, if you want to, to pick your favorites, feel free to do so. Yeah, um, there's, a t there's a testing one here um, that asks, um, is there a clean way to mock a read-only signal exposed with the read-only field? Um, can you see that again? Is there a clean way to mock a read-only signal exposed as a read-only field? Mm. So that's for unit testing, of course. So you have a read-only signal, which means you cannot reassign something to it, and you want to mock it. Now, the real question is, why would you want to mock a signal, since you can set the value to it? I would. I don't think you would ever need to mock a signal, because it's not like an API or third-party code. It's really part of what you're testing, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I never thought about it, because I would never mock a signal, <laughs> really. So yeah. <laughs> All right, I have a, another one came in that asks, um, since signals provide their own APIs for setting dot set and getting um, like the dot values um what is the advantage of all the extra code to expose a read-only copy and separate the or in a separate setter function yeah so in in the current implementation there's not much use for the the extra getter and setter um you you could really get rid of them and make it public and it would be very very similar um Part of the reason why I do it is to show you that there's a read-only method, so you can, you know, know that it exists. And 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 if you want to to do something that's truly read-only with no setter, for instance, and only the service would change the value and emit it, 
then it would be a, a nice way to do it. But yeah, in, in that specific scenario, you don't need the getter and setter. That's 100% accurate, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Another question is, what is the difference between using the dot set and dot update signal methods? Yes, that's a, a very good question. So when you use dot set, you are setting a completely new value to that signal. If we use update, so update is when the value that you're setting depends on the previous value. So if we had the previous currency and we somehow needed to derive a new value from the previous currency, then we would use update, which is a, a very rare use case, right? So we, we don't have that, uh, we don't need that in, in that scenario. Only if you have, let's say, a counter or something like this, where you want to increase the previous value or change the previous value, in that case, you use update. But if the value is brand new and not related to the previous one, then you, you use set. So most likely 99% of the time you want to use set. All right, last one is, um, do I use a signal for every value that I want to use in the template or is there a good practice when to use a signal and when to use a normal class member variable? Yeah, th that's a, a great question. And my answer is basically gonna be based on, you know, the change detection. If you want that very precise change detection to work for everything and, and be applied to every single value that you display in your app, then the answer is yes. Any Anything that's supposed to be displayed in a template should be in a signal because that's the only way you can get that new change detection. So I would, I would really rely on signals for pretty much everything, yeah. And, and remember, they're cheap to use. They, they don't have much of a cost associated to it. Uh, so it's just a good habit to get into, and that's how you, you're going to get, you know, the, the best possible chain detection. So yes, I, I would use them as much as possible. Don't, don't be afraid of using them. Okay. Um, you want to ask any more or answer any more? Um, yeah, I see there were still quite a few. So let's do one last and then I'll get back to the code. Okay. Um, it says, can we add a signal with input or with the input decorator, or can it only be added via the input function? Uh, you could use the old syntax if you wanted to, but again, the goal, the goal of these new functions is really to, to help for the future of change detection by telling the framework, this is a signal based input. So Angular can see instantly, this is a signal and, and, and mark this as a, as a dependency. And as a result, if you, if you want to pass a signal as an input, just, just use the input function. Don't, don't use the old decorator. So it's just a habit to take. Um, and, and you can use them on the old inputs, like what I did with my plate and button text. You can tell that I didn't change the code that was using those, right? It's still passing text and an object. So Angular is automatically turning those into a signal. So it's, yeah, it, it's as, as most things with signals, I would say it's free to use. Uh, and, and, it, and it's an easy change to make in your applications. Just use those signal inputs instead of regular inputs. So yeah, my answer would be, Always use the function, really, because that's how you're going to get the benefits of that change detection. OK. Um, actually, I, there's one more that I'm curious about, too. And it's, um, is there is an, anything in the Chrome DevTools that you wanna, that you know of that shows the current value of a stored? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I went over it quickly earlier. I'll do it again. So these are the Chrome DevTools. Uh, the Angular DevTools extension. If I go over my app currency switcher component, oh, do I need to refresh? I go over app currency switcher, and you can see right there that it's showing me the value of my signal, right? I don't need to do anything. It says currency is a read only signal with a value of USD. And if I want to see what's in the service, I can open my service and same thing, I see the value here. And it's not just a default value. If I change it to Euro, see it's 
being updated in both places. So nice and easy, no need for a breakpoint or anything. You can just see the value of the signal from the dev tools directly, which, which is very powerful. <laughs> very cool. Nice tip, yeah. All right, so back to our code. Back to our code with the currency service. So the last step is that we want to actually change the prices. If I change the currency, I have to apply an exchange rate to those values. And, um, and when we apply an exchange rate, um, the, the prices should, should get updated accordingly. So if I switch from US dollar to Euro, it's not just the symbol that changes, it's the amount. So we have to multiply the amount by an exchange rate. So these exchange rates, I have a backend for that. Here's a URL. I'm going to open it quickly here. So that's what it returns. You can tell that it's just a currency and a number, which is the exchange rate for that currency. Nice and easy. And so we want to use it in our app. So we have a service. We are going to need the HTTP client. So let's inject it. Inject HTTP client. And once we have that HTTP client, we want to get our exchange rates. Exchange rates. So it's going to be this.http dot get and go to that URL. So this is an observer. So I will use the dollar sign convention. And the thing is, I don't want to subscribe to it because I don't want to use RxJS. That's the a big part of using signals is to, to remove RxJS as much as possible. And so what I'm going to do instead is create another signal here. I'm going to call it exchange rates, and I'm going to use another function called to signal. And as you can see, to signal comes from Angular for RxJS interrupt, and it's going to allow us to convert our observable into a signal. And now we have that exchange rate, which is a signal of exchange rates. So what are exchange rates? Well, we saw that they are an object. So let's create a type for that. I'm going to add an interface. Exchange rates. And we saw that it looked like this. So it's mapping a currency to a number, euro number, USD number. And what was the last one? GBP number, I made a typo up here. So that's the type that we're using, really. Um, the thing is, this works, but we can do better. Because TypeScript is a great language, and it allows us to always find tricks to make our types more uh, generic, more reusable, and, and, and smarter. Because the thing is, if we add another currency in the future, this would not see it. We would, we would have to think about updating that interface which is never a good idea, right? As a developers, we want to make sure that we, we protect our code from ourselves, <laughs> for our future selves, and make it easy for, for us or for them, for the developers working with that code in the future, that they don't have to think about side effects and that kind of stuff. So this works, but it's not safe enough. Instead, we can use the following type. I can make it a record. And I can say that it's a record of currency to number. And by doing that, um, you can see that the compiler knows exactly that it's the, the, the object that we get is going to be USD number, GBP number, Euro number. So when you use record, you're defining a mapping from a source type to another type. And it's going to use all of the values of that source type. 
So that makes my exchange rates a lot more meaningful and a lot more resilient to future changes, a lot more precise. So what we, that's what we get from the server here. So our HTTP GET is returning exchange rates. And as a result, our two signal is also going to be of exchange rates. So this is a signal of possibly exchange rates. But you can see that in the type here, it says exchange rates are undefined. Why does it say are undefined? That's because when we create the signal, this request hasn't run yet. And so the value of the signal is undefined for a very short amount of time initially. If we don't want that, if we don't want to have to deal with undefined, this two signal function takes a second param, which is initial value. So we can pass an initial value that would prevent from ever having to deal with undefined. In the case of my exchange rates, I could say that a default value just has all of the exchange rates set to one. It's, it's not a big deal because in any case, this is just temporary and it's just going to be for a few milliseconds maximum. Um, and the value is still somewhat meaningful. It's not going to break anything. And since by default, our prices are in USD, the exchange rate is one for USDs anyways, because we have a price in US dollars. So no big deal to use that initial value. And just because I did this, now my signal doesn't have undefined anymore. It's a signal of exchange rates. So that's a lot better. So let's make sure it's working. And using our dev tools, we can probably see that. Unless, oh, it's private, so maybe it's not showing up. Yeah, it's a private property, so we don't see it. So, OK. We'll take a look at it later then. Um, so at this point, we have a component that needs to know about the currency and the exchange rate. And all we expose is the currency with that getter. And what we really want to, to expose is not just the currency, but also that number that goes with it, that exchange rate. So I'm going to change things a little bit now. I'm going to add another type. Uh, so it's going to be an interface. And I'm going to call it currency info. And that currency info is going to be a mapping. You know, what is the current currency? And what is the exchange rate for it? And that's going to represent the current value that we want to to deal with. And so what we want to expose here is not just a signal of currency, but a signal of currency info. So our components have access to the entire thing. Now, the problem with this is that to get that currency info, I need to know what is the current currency from that signal. And I need to know the exchange rates from that other signals. So I need to get the values from two different signals. And how do we do that? Well, good news for us. Uh, I'm going to create another signal derived from these two values. And in signals, the way to do this is to use a function called computed. So computed is a way to really define a transformation to define an effect, not quite, but to define the transformation that has to happen when any number of signals change and we want to compute a new value out of them. So I'll show you what I mean in this function. So what do we want to do? What do we want to get as currency info? We want to get an object. We want to return an object that's just a currency and an exchange rate. So I want to return, I'm going to make this an object like this for readability purposes, where we have the currency that comes from our currency signal, like this. And we want to have an exchange rate that comes from our exchange rates signal, for which we read the value 
that corresponds to our current currency, right? Because Mr. Exchange Rates is an object like this with a currency and a number. So we read the entry corresponding to the current currency. And that's going to be the exchange rate. So the nice thing about this computed is that because we, we read two signals inside of it, we read currency and we read exchange rates, these two signals become dependencies of that computed signal. And as a result, when we change the currency or when the exchange rate changes, when any of these two things get updated, computed gets a new value that's going to be inside that third signal. So this signal is now a signal of currency info, which means it's the one we want to return down here, this dot currency info. And I don't have to turn it into a read-only thing because uh, a computed signal is already read-only because it's, it's really Angular computing the value. So we don't want to, uh, we don't need an extra safety net on top of that. It's already read-only. And so I update my getter like this, um, which means if I go back to my currency switcher component, now this is currency info, currency info. And in my template, this is going to become currency info dot currency. So we read the currency property of currency info. And in my license plate component, license plate component TS, uh, currency, also this is going to be info as well, currency info. So it comes from store view, currency info, currency info, just renaming it all over the place. And here, currency info. Which means now this is currency info dot currency. So this is a symbol that we use to format the, the price. And the price, we want to change it. We want to multiply it by the exchange rate. So we do the, the following. So we read the price from a signal, we multiply it by the exchange rate from another signal, and we apply the currency pipe to format with the currency symbol from that signal as well. So it's all signals everywhere. We have full reactivity all over the place. And let's see if it's working. So refreshing, so far so good. USD, prices are in USD. I go up here. Select Euro and 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 it didn't apply the exchange rate somehow. GBP didn't apply the exchange rates. So did I break something somehow? Going back to my service. Could it be that the compiler missed something somehow? Let's check my output. Oh yeah, I have a compiler issue here. Currency switcher component TS. Oh yeah, forgot to import currency info, that's why. Now compiler is happy. So I go back here. Yeah, that's live coding. <laughs> USD, I go to Euro, my price is in Euros. The exchange rate was applied, GBP. My price is in GBP, the exchange rate was applied. And so the nice thing about all of this, and, and one of the things I really like about signals is the simplicity of combining those different values into just one thing. Because with RxJS, we would need, you know, we would need operators like maybe a switch map or a combine latest or something like this. And we would have to remember, oh, which one do we use? Is it, is it combine latest? Is it, is it with latest from, or, you know, all of that extra knowledge is needed with signals computed. And that's all you need. If you know about computed, you're good to go. Then you have, you, you can derive a value from, from anything 
And no matter what happens, so you saw that when I change the currency or the exchange rate, this computed signal gets updated and my components just get the updated value out of it automatically. So the amount of code in the end is very minimal. You, you could almost express all of these things in, in just one line of code. Uh, I zoom in a lot, so I, I, I did different lines here and here and there, but uh, you can really express a lot in a very minimalistic fashion. Oh, well, this one could have been made private as well. Um, but now that it's public, I can use that as an opportunity to show the value in the DevTools. So yeah, we can see currency info is a signal, currency GBP exchange rate 131. And our service stores that currency info as a read-only signal that has, and we can see the exchange rates and everything. So yeah, you, you can read the value of the signals right from the DevTools, uh, which makes it super easy as well to, to adopt them. With RxJS, we didn't have that. Only with behavior subjects could you know what's inside at any point in time. Um, I guess we can do a final Q&A because we are at the end timing wise, so we can take a few more questions. I covered everything I wanted to show you, you know, kind of give you an idea of how to think about using signals, what are the, the different, you know, the mindset to have and really starting using those input functions or output, uh, migrating slowly everything to signals, which is going to enable that change detection uh, that's you know super precise pinpointed to every single view in your app uh, i listed a few links here including the link to my slides my email address blog newsletter certifications everything is on that screen so feel free to reach out if you have any questions if you want access to that code same thing feel free to send me an, an email or reach out on on linkedin and and yeah if we have time uh, queue if you want to go through a few more questions i can i can do that yeah we can ask a couple more uh a, a, a bundle of them though were essentially should i be using signals everywhere like if i have an observable should i be converting it to a two signal what is the issue of just making everything um signals yeah so i guess the the easiest answer to this would be if your if the end goal is to display something in the template, that final something should be a signal, ideally, because that's how you get the benefits of the change detection. Now, everything upstream of that, so before you get to that template, could be still RxJS based. You could still have operators, you could still have subjects and everything if you want to, as long as in the final step, you, you do that conversion to a signal so that you get the change detection for your component. So you don't have to rewrite everything yet, even though, I mean, I would advocate that a lot of things are easier to read and understand with, you know, computed compared to operators, but that's, maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, another one was um, when using two signal, how do you deal with undefined? For example, when we want to wait for the value to arrive or- oh, yeah. So the way I dealt with it was to get rid of it by using a default value, right? By having that initial value. Uh, if, if you don't do that, then you would have to just use, you know, extra question mark like this in the case of undefined. Because the value could be undefined. So you, and, and the compiler would basically tell you and, and would force you to do this. So th that would be the approach. Just, just use these extra question marks everywhere, which can be a little bit painful. So I would really recommend finding a meaningful initial value as much as possible. If it's an array of data, then you can use an empty array that, you know, super nice and easy. Um, if an object, objects can be a, a little bit more tricky in terms of default values. This one, I was lucky. But uh, yeah, that, that that's really how you deal with it. Either you, you provide a, a default value, and then you don't have undefined. Otherwise, you have the possibility of having undefined and then you have to use the, the safe uh, navigation operator with the question mark. All right. In that same vein, someone asked, 
if you are wrapping an HTTP call or not an HTTP call, but something that's just a long lived event, how do you handle unsubscribing from it? Oh, so the unsubscription is all done by two signal. So you don't have to worry about subscribing and subscribing Two signal is doing all of that for you. So that's nice and easy. Easy peasy. All right. Last one is, is the code for this project available somewhere online? Uh, yes, I can make it available. Uh, I, I have to save it. And then if you want it, just reach out to me and I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> awesome. I'll put my yeah. info back on the screen. You can send me an email or LinkedIn or whatever, and I'll be happy to, to send it to you, that code, if you want. Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, Alan, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this was an awesome turnout. We had over 100 people at one point. Um, I, I've answered it somewhere else, but the the live will be available on YouTube in about three weeks. Uh, catch it on the YouTube channel for um, NGConf webinars. Everybody have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye.